Representative Sullivan, aye. Representative Copeland, aye. Representative Adams, aye. Representative Alferman, aye. Representative Inlicker, aye. Representative Henson, aye. Representative Newman, aye. Representative Fouch, aye. Representative Rose, aye. Representative Gray. They voted nine ayes and zero noes. You have voted House Committee substitute for House Bill 1566, do pass. This time, I move to do pass House Bill 2239. This is represented Lance Bill that requires any driver's license issued to a person who is not a citizen of the United States to have a distinguishing mark on the front of the license that specifies the individual is a non-citizen. It's voted out of the Transportation Committee with one amendment by a vote of 10 to 2. Representative Copeland, would you explain the bill name to us? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This uh, came to us, and this kind of gets in line with some of the other states, some of the larger states in the nation. Um, California, with the largest, one of the largest cities, uh, Illinois, with Chicago, one, another one of the largest cities, has adopted this. And uh, so we're kind of getting in line with with other states that uh, that have uh, driver's license for non-U.S. citizens. Um, and then I'd also like to offer an amendment of .02H. This was uh, offered by Representative Corman, and instead of saying non-citizen, as does the the bill, the underlying bill, this would give the uh, origin of citizenship, country of citizenship on the front of the driver's license. Um, discussion on the amendment itself. I would like, uh, the bill sponsor is not here right now, but I know Representative Lant was really not supportive of this amendment and did not really want it included in his bill. Um, in reviewing what other states have, I was looking over some of the paperwork that was provided to us from research. Um, other states have sometimes a separate, different kind of license, and uh, they do have a distinguishing mark, but I didn't really see any license plates that, a license, driver's license that said um, country of origin. They had more of just a, 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 a mark on it. But is there, um, so I just wanted to throw in that the, the bill sponsor did not support this amendment. Is there any discussion on the amendment itself? Yes, Representative Alperman. What was the, can you walk me through what the purpose of the, the country of origin was? Or was there, was there much discussion over what? what it got away from any discrimination of saying non-citizen. You're, you're saying you're not a citizen of the United States, where if you said you were, uh, from Canada or Mexico or Puerto Rico or what have you, it would give your country of origin, or if that's your country of citizenship on the driver, on the Missouri driver's license, indicating that you are not a U.S. citizen. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Newman. Uh, to uh, make a statement, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the amendment's really kind of difficult to address because we haven't yet addressed the underlying bill. So I feel like this is, I know procedurally this is what we do, but yet this whole discussion completely is out of order in my mind uh, because we haven't yet discussed why we actually uh, need the bill, let alone then to go further in terms of why we need the amendment. And my comment on country of origin is we still have not uh, determined what the purpose of that would be. And I uh, have also looked at the documents that were provided uh, by research and there is no state, there is no state that marks their driver's license. If you look at the states and what they do with their various types of, uh, of driver's licenses that, that they issue, including California, including Colorado, uh, not one of them says on there that they are non-citizens. Not one of them says their country of origin. So I would urge this body to uh, uh, to vote down this amendment because to use that argument, other states are doing it or not doing it is really not valid. 
Um, we still have not heard the purpose of the underlying bill, uh, and to there go further and to vote on an amendment uh, that expands that purpose of the underlying bill, I feel like it's really doing this, this committee a disservice. So I would urge people to actually, um, I've got the, the documents, I've also got a brief that goes through each state and the different types of uh, driver's licenses they issue. Uh, but to agree with uh, uh, Representative Alderman, not one state does list a country of origin. And once we do talk about the underlying bill, you'll understand, hopefully, that there are various types of non-citizens that are actually working, residing um, in our uh, in our country, in our state. Uh, this is all done through uh, the, the State Department. Again, we do not. Uh, uh, we do not, as a state of Missouri, are involved in uh, any type of immigration, any type of uh, uh, approving any uh, State Department documents. So therefore, going ahead and talking about the amendment in terms of is it good or bad, I feel like we really put the, the, the cart before the horse. But I will urge uh, the body to, there is no purpose to even have country of origin on your uh, driver's license, and I hopefully when we discuss the bill, you'll understand. Representative in liquor. Just to make a statement also, you know, some people in Missouri use their driver's license form uh, to, uh, when they vote, they present that instead of their vote card. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering if this will go to constitutionality, maybe, or? Well, from, uh, I've actually gone to Secretary of State's office when I get my first year on elections. And when you register to vote, most commonly, most people have a social security number. And whether you're um, an immigrant or not, people have a social security number. And that's the first thing that is run when you register to vote. And when you pull up someone's social security number, within 90 seconds, all of their information comes up. And if you remember, one of the requirements to be eligible to vote is to be a citizen of the United States. It clearly would show immediately that you are not a citizen of the United States, therefore you are not eligible to register to vote. Therefore, you would not be on the voter registration forms. Right. And the, the, uh, the interval you put in. Right back out. Oh, in the MCDR, when we went into that in the early 90s, uh, took off that little box of citizenship declaration because of the of being able to do that. And, and, and you all understand with when and uh, voter registration comes in for each county, it doesn't. The secretary of state is oversees it, but doesn't do it. And since now, uh, because of technology, uh, we can know things extremely fast. So again, that social security number is what most people use. It's not required to be used for to register to vote. And so, therefore, you're not eligible to register to vote. Therefore, you could not register to vote. Therefore, if you showed up even under confusion, thinking you were registered to vote, your name would not be there. Right, and, and at least they use the last four digits on there sometimes. I think. Right, but it yeah. still gives all the information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none. Um, I would recommend the chairman would recommend that we vote this amendment down. The bill sponsor doesn't support it, and mm -hmm. to be honest with you, know other states require this, so would be my recommendation to the committee. At this time, our representative Coltmeyer has moved to the adoption of House Committee Amendment 1. All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it, and you have failed to adopt House Committee Amendment number 1. Um, we can discuss this bill. The bill sponsor is not here to explain um, the reasoning behind uh, this bill. My recommendation is that we should postpone this hearing until the bill sponsor is in attendance. To help explain the bill further, um, I would just, I don't know if the committee would kind of agree with that. It's his bill, he would be probably the best person to explain it to all of us. So um, I'm going to make a recommendation that we postpone um, this hearing until the bill sponsors in attendance. This time I move to do pass. Madam Chair, you have a, uh, a motion on the floor that I think we need to carry on. Make a motion to withdraw that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, Representative Coltman. Keep it legal. 
Um, at this time, we move to do pass House Bill 1829. This is Representative McGaugh's bill that establishes the Political Accountability and Campaigning Act. Once a candidate is filed for office, he or she will be prohibited from knowingly publicizing a false statement of fact by another candidate for the office via the print or broadcast media. It was voted out of the Elections Committee by a vote of 8 to 2. Representative Finlicker, would you like to explain the bill to us? Um, well, I, again, I wish uh, Ms. McGaugh was here to talk about the bill. Um, because I don't feel like I thoroughly understand his motive. But uh, when I looked at um, chapter 562 and what, what was mentioned uh, in the text of the bill, uh, that talks about uh, purposely, knowingly, recklessly, uh, criminal net negligence acts when you talk about a candidate. Uh, so I guess it's just more or less trying to keep people from making bad comments about someone else and then being also responsible for the comments that they do make about that person. Yes. Well, I feel like we need to give them a little more of a chance to talk about the bill, um, you know, be here to explain it. So, yeah, I would um, recommend also that we postpone this bill until the bill sponsor appears to do that. So I withdraw the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. We'll postpone this hearing. Um, is there any further business that needs to come before? Oh, here it comes. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. This time I move to do pass House Bill 1829. Representative McGaugh, we were about ready to leave without you. I figured I was last on the list. I could be. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't. Not here's Cuddy. Um, you want to go ahead and explain your bill to us a little bit? Yeah, so I guess kind of what I'm trying to do is just and it's called a political accountability campaign. Just try to bring some accountability back to <laughs> campaigns and, and the people who are actually running and to take accountability of the things that not only they say, but their surrogates say in campaigns. So if there are knowingly false uh, ads or the campaign ads that are put out there, the people who these are put out against have a cause of action. So it's a knowingly standard, which is different from the slander and libel. Those are still in effect. Um, many courts have interpreted that knowingly standard is actually a higher standard than actual malice is required. So, um, and then once someone is fined, instead of um, being fined, they can retract their statements. So, uh, several states have worked on this. Very few have been very successful. So, it's more of a conversation piece than anything, really. Um, I, I would love for it to move forward further and get to the House floor so we could have the conversation. Is, is there any questions for the bill sponsor for discussion on the bill? Yes, Representative Adams. Uh, to inquire and try to get some information. Yeah, I'll proceed. Uh, wasn't a bill, you know, it's prior to my time here in the state legislature, but wasn't a bill passed a few years ago, in a sense, I want to say absolving or making it very difficult to prove these things against people? Well, the, there's a 1964 case uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court, New York Times versus Sullivan. Uh -huh. And in that case, basically what they said is any comment or public statement that has anything to do with the public interest, uh -huh. with, which they've interpreted political campaigns to be that, again, that the standard is higher, that not only do you have to prove uh -huh. your, your standard facts in your libel or slander case but also that the, the comment was said with actual malice meaning that you you said it meaning to hurt the person you said it against well in a political campaign you know it's a hard standard to prove in court now what my bill does is it, it takes what we're looking for is knowingly which is as I said, courts have interpreted is a higher standard than actual malice, but in the true course of things, that's easier to prove than is the actual malice. The reason why I bring this up is because I, because I, I don't know, I had an interesting campaign 
to get elected here mm -hmm. and someone published a well let's be honest twenty thousand dollars worth of material against me right semi maybe a kernel of truth somewhere in the corner there under a lampshade with no light on <laughs> Well, can you, you know, and, and I thought, because I had gone to a number of attorneys, and I thought the Missouri legislature had passed legislation in a sense absolving them of. Yeah, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, it could have happened. I, I've only been here for four years, too, so it could have, you know, could have 20 years ago. Who knows? No, it, it was <laughs> I, I know. Uh, I'll have to research and find out when it, when it happened because it was. Not nice. Is there any further questions? Yes, Representative Newman. Okay. Um, yeah, Representative, we talked about this in our committee, and I don't really think, I don't remember our discussion you know, right. going at length. Uh, but, I mean, we're, we all immediately go back to our own individual campaigns, and, um, and the other thing that we've got going to is a time limit, because obviously we have deadlines on the, right. the races. I don't know when you say knowingly. Um, I don't know how a candidate, regardless of who is paying for the the publication, because you're talking about publicizing. So you're talking, like you said, print or broadcast. Right. How I don't know how you would actually prove that. I, I mean, I don't know. Plus, you're and, and then actually, who is actually you're talking about? avoiding a penalty by retracting statement um i mean we're really getting down into a you know a free speech issue here at the same time you know all of us have had our voting record taking out of context that's knowingly yet i don't really know how we would come back as candidates and actually prove we've had people have had publications against them on you know, uh, sex offender registry, all of these things. So no, no, again, that, the burden now that one, now that one should be easy to prove. Well, it should be right, which is what I'm trying to take care of now. The issue with with uh, you know your voting record and then and someone spending it, you know that that is exactly why. But most of the states who have implemented tried to implement a law like this, my bill is different because I take it straight to the judge and the jury. Those other uh, laws in other states, specifically Ohio, they have their ethics commission, much like the Missouri Ethics Commission, decide these type of cases. And the Ninth Appellate Circuit Court struck it down, basically saying, you know, bureaucrats are making decisions on what is political speech. So how my bill is different is we're saying this goes to the courts and to the people to make those determinations. Courts make determinations all the time of what a material fact is and is not. And I would agree that there are uh, difficulties in proving those issues sometimes. My, my impetus in this is, is the big, bad, nasty lies is what we're going to try to get rid of. I'd like to get rid of all of those small, as what the representative said, you know, the skintilla of, of uh, you know, bad acts. That being said, I how think I that? right, but I think that. how do you start to take steps to stop that? But for filing a bill such as this, and hope hopefully schlepping it along for lack of better terms to see what kind of traction we can make, because I think everyone can agree that we need to have campaigns that are built on uh, real conversation, not mudslinging. That's what we're trying to do. And, and I understand your intent. It kind of goes back to how do we legislate that? And yet, I think Pretty we up. need to have a lot more information on what is constitutional, what is not. I mean, I know that we are a separate branch of government. We can come up with our own you know, uh, pieces of law, regardless if they're actually uh, constitutional. And I just, I just believe that we kind of need a whole lot more here. We all understand your intent. But I'm, I'm really reluctant 
not being a constitutional attorney, and, and the majority of us are not, in terms of understanding what the limitations already are in terms of, of free speech. And yet, as candidates, we don't like this. We don't have time to deal with this. Um, and of course, then you throw in a, a, a prime candidate, because I've been through legislation, or I've been through litigation involving um, a race during a race. Uh, you've got the total time factor. You also have the factor of, um, of judges, even particularly our appellate court, are not experts also in election law because of the very few cases. They don't even want to deal with this. We don't have time to deal with this. How do you deal with this? I mean, I know what you're trying to say, but it's like, right. And I would say this, you, this is probably more of a, you know, this was in front of the court. It's more, more of a speech case, like a slander of libel case than it is an elections case. The, the only thing that really makes this an elections case is that we're talking about candidates. political candidates. So, I mean, as far as talking about R. Snow 115, there's probably not a whole lot of comments in a court case that will be in that regard. But I, but I do understand, you know, I understand the limitations as far as constitutionally. Um, again, what, what we're trying to do, and it is, it is fairly confusing in that the standard now is you have to prove your standard elements for libel and slander plus actual knowledge for a public figure. And what I'm trying to do is kind of shift the paradigm from that to the knowingly standard. So it is, you know, we're thinking outside the box here is what we're, what we're trying to do. Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, I really think that we almost, uh, even as a body, need to have a lot more time, not just in not just you and I mean, mm -hmm. us discussing it, sure. but to have experts really present us both sides of what we're, what we're getting into by considering it. Is there any, is there any further discussion on the bill? Um, it's represented longer. Yes, I'm not really clear on the uh, necessity to um, increase the standards. We have malice, we have defamation of character. Um, it is, I would think it would be very difficult to prove normally. Uh, once you mentioned the uh, she was the sign up with us to the uh, sex offender, you said it was easy, but the person truly thought the person was on the sex offender information. Now, yes, he could have checked. So, would you say what well, you should have checked, or did you? Yeah, so, so there's two, that's, that's a kind of a scale there. Like in that, that situation, um, what the court would do is basically, you know, the burden is upon the person who made the statement to make sure that what they're actually putting out there is, is true. So the knowingly standard, you know, if I said you were red today, you know, that was that was disparaging. We we could we could prove that that wasn't true by the facts surrounding the case. Now, okay. but what the actual now the actual malice that that is in the the law now that you have to prove. No one's going to sit in court or in a deposition and say, I said this to specifically hurt someone, which is basically what they're asking to do. You know, I said this with the intent, almost criminal intent, to hurt someone. They're not going to admit to that. They're they're going to say, you know, we're just disseminating this information. Now if I can prove they knowingly disseminated something we can prove to be wrong, that would be the knowingly standard. Okay. 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 Thank you. I, I think you're trying to get around because basically, we're, anyone who is a public figure doesn't have any protection. So are you, you got, trying to you get got around? You got protection, but it's it's so it's such a strict standard that any attorney basically can advise their client to keep their mouth shut to avoid any type of criminal issues that it, you're never going to be able to prove in court. And because of that, campaigns and political consultants and campaign basically know that they can put whatever they want to, and unfortunately it works. And that's what we're trying to get around. Again, I we can't legislate bad acts and good acts. We want to promote good acts and good campaigns. Are there any other states that have done something similar? Yeah, there's, there's been a couple of states. And again, those have been struck down because instead of taking these issues to the courts, they've taken them to basically a, a lower review board, much like an ethics board. Um, so that's why I, whenever we did the language on this bill, we, we basically said that they would get the courts and the prosecutors would be involved as well. 
So when I do a mailer um, or a radio ad or anything like that, I, I generally use a, a publishing company to, to do that for me. I, I kind of play out what I want to say and, and, and then it goes out. So if I do that, then who is held uh, under the under this bill? It, would it be me or would it be the company that I that who pays for the so, so, so my, my, my campaign committee would pay for it. And then it gets sent out. I mean, and, 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 and what if, and then, and then to go further on that, what if they make a change that I, on a, on a proof that I didn't really say, oh, that, that, that goes a little bit too far. I don't, I'm not comfortable with that, but they send it out anyways. Then am I held liable or is my committee or? And, and it would be the can, and I don't want to not answer your question, but it's all about why I call it political accountability. And I've said that, you know, we have too many surrogates in political campaigns. You know, what the biggest weakness to this bill that I see is that I, I don't have, I basically talk about candidates, not you know, the people who run their campaign, not the local operatives and those type of people. And we all know a lot of times the worst of the worst come from not from a candidate, but from third party groups. That to me is the constitutional issue. I think that we should hold the candidates to a higher burden. A higher level, so that's why I'm not saying you know, the buck should stop with them. And, and that's much like the federal level, where everything you see or hear, the candidate says I approve this message, or this is in no way associated with this candidate. And, 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 and I and I and I see where, I, and I'm not trying to dispute the merits of the bill, right. but I believe that legally the the campaign treasurer of a candidate committee is ultimately the one who is responsible for the expenditure of funds. So if my campaign treasurer, if, for instance, goes rogue and he approves the expenditure of this money that to, for, for a mailer that maybe I didn't approve, but it's still my candidate committee, I would still be the one who's on the hook for that, not my, my treasurer or the one who actually approved the expenditure of funds. This, yeah, I understand it that way, too. Okay, thank you. Yep. Well, and I had told Representative McGall we would, we would give you a hearing on this. I think it's been a great discussion. I'm going to go ahead and withdraw the motion, but I appreciate your bill and I appreciate what you're trying to do. And I, I really think it's good that the committee heard this bill, but I think we're going to go ahead and uh, postpone until we can have further information. And I do think it's a great idea that maybe you will further work, and I appreciate you bringing it forward to the committee. This time, is there any further business that needs to come before the committee? If none, adjourn.